provided us with a rather confusing stance in today's debate, and it makes it a little bit difficult to make this speech, but I'll try to clarify what it is that they told us. Well, firstly, they tell us that they also want progressive taxation, but simultaneously, in the same speech, they criticize us for removing incentives to work and for infringing on private property. We think that the model that they provide here distinguishes itself so little from the model that we provide that it makes it very difficult to distinguish between these two sides. And we think that the arguments that they bring against us also apply to many of their own arguments if they want progressive taxation as well. But anywho, we have to assume that there are different in today's debate, so what I'm going to assume is that we have a stronger focus on progressive taxation and that they also have an emphasis on market forces in terms of uh, evening out these differences. So since both sides clearly care about um, uh, what happens uh, what happens to poor people, and things, both sides clearly think that's the most important metric, I think the most important thing to just debate upon is who better benefits the poor and whose mechanisms is most important. But let me just first clarify what we actually stand for in today's debate. They simply stand for a state where the state, uh, the state owns everything, no thank you, where there's no private property, where the state, all, state owns all companies. Um, we think this is, this is not actually true. This is what we clarify in our states. We say we have a distinct, like we distinguish between socialism and communism in the like in the um, uh, because of the different scale, right? We tell you that the, in, in, like no thank you in communism, the state owns everything, right? The state owns all industries. All industries are nationalized. The state has like 100% taxation. In socialism, we have the difference in that we have a slightly smaller scale. However, we do still think no thank you that we want massive redistribution. Well, we just don't think that we want all, which is why their arguments about how you cannot self-actualize and you cannot achieve goals are not legitimate. But let's talk about the three important things in today's debate. Firstly, I'm going to deal with, with the practical issue of who actually helps the poor. Secondly, I'm going to deal with this principle, which they suddenly seem to care about in their second speech, no thank you. And thirdly, this idea of abuse and corruption. Let me first talk about the practical benefits. Who actually benefits the poor? Well, we think this is the most important thing by far in today's debate, since both sides seem to agree that that's what we should care about. Okay, so what do we bring to you? We think that when we redistribute money, we directly give money, no thank you, to a poor minor, or like to the poor people who can actually use this money in a better way. We directly redistribute the money to someone who can purchase something that gives them more happiness. Someone who can purchase an education, no thank you, that allows them opportunities in life. Someone who can purchase a meal that allows their family to survive. Um, rather than like someone who will just save the money in a bank account or like buy a lot of beauty. What do they say? We tell, they say like our mechanism is um, having market forces, no thank you, that innovate, which somehow benefits the poor, without really clarifying how innovation specifically benefits the poor. Okay, but uh, anywho, let's talk about why there's not actually less innovation um, on our side of the house. So firstly, we think that innovation is not at all solely motivated by money. We think it's very much motivated by the idea of, like, working is very much motivated by the idea of, of identity and how it gives you a sense of meaning in life. We tell that even if Denmark, which is a socialist country, we have some of the most like famous in like innovative companies in the world, such as like Novo Nordisk, which produces instruments for the entire world. We think this is because fundamentally, like no thank you, uh, when you innovate, it's because you want to self-actualize, it's because you want to achieve high goals. We think that's why there will still be innovation, even if there's fewer financial incentives. Um, and still though, like we still think you could benefit to some extent by uh, by doing. Um, by innovating, right? Because we don't buy 100% taxation. That means that you can still get more money from innovating, even if it's, to a, if it's to a small degree. That means you still have a financial incentive to innovate. Secondly, though, we think it's a wrong, wrong characterization that they bring that we need to give the money to the rich people so they can innovate. We think rich people are actually very unlikely to innovate. We think the poor are likely to innovate. Why is that? That's because the rich people already have a good quality of life, which means that this incentive of getting more money, well, no thank you, has less impact on them. Um, uh, they tend to instead like save the money in bank accounds for their children uh, and their future. They tend to instead like no thank you invest it in the stock market. We don't think they necessarily tend to in, like put it into innovation because they have less incentive to do so. How about the poor then? The poor have a desperate need to improve their standing in life. The poor have a desperate need to make their money become more. That's why poor are much more likely to innovate. That's why concepts like microloans work because like poor people often have an idea, no thank you, about opening some kind of store or something um, that can actually make the money they have become more money. Furthermore, what's, that's why it's so important that we, on our side of the house, unlock this workforce that, like, on their side of the house, uh, or under a state without socialism, literally cannot, like, get the education, no thank you, that means that we benefit from the ideas that we have. That means that we create more innovation on our side of the house, because, no thank you, we have more different people who are actually able to innovate. Lastly, though, we think that the benefits of innovation that they talk about actually don't really trickle down to the poor, especially the minorities, as they seem to just assume without giving you any analysis. No, thank you. That's because the poor don't really have money to buy these like great cheap products that they're producing on their side of the house if they don't know that you have jobs in the first place. Therefore, we don't think innovation actually benefits the poor. 
What we do on our side of the house is that we ensure direct benefits to the poor. We ensure that we give no thank you. We give them money, tangible money, right now that they can use to improve their standing in life. We think this is much better than assuming that some kind of societal mechanisms that have historically been proven to not work will happen. Um, okay, so let's deal with this next, uh, next theme in today's debate, which is the idea about the principle and the role of the government, which you are a bit iffy about, because they seem to also like, recognize that we have to have progressive taxation because of the law reform, etc. No thank you. But then in the last speech, they began to bring up this argument about how you have a, like, you have a right to self-actualization and how that's really important. As I stated in the beginning, we think this argument is negated by the fact that we don't actually take up like all of your wealth. That means that you still have an ability to pursue like uh, different things you want in life. The government is not like assigning you one job, which is the only job you can do. You still have opportunities to do many different things. You still have opportunity to become proposed, promoted. You still have opportunities to innovate something um, that actually benefits your life. That means we don't think we actually take away the right to like to self-actualize in society. So we think that this principle falls. Okay. Um, Do you know why, man? Yeah, sure. So you said that the government will not take all resources, although it is contradictory to your speakers, if you don't take all resources, how will you redistribute Chinese? Well, still, if we take like 60% of people resources, we still, we still think that we still have loads of money for redistribution, which like is basically what socialism is. Like that's what happens in Denmark, which is like the prime example of the socialist state. Like we'd be happy to take even more, maybe like 70 or 80%. We just don't think it should be a hundred percent. And we don't think we have to support that because that's communism. Let's get into this last idea about corruption and government abuse. So they tell us that government will abuse this money that they get from taxes. Okay, so first of all, we don't think that we inherently have to support like the Soviet Union under Stalin. We don't think that it's like it is directly translated into socialism. If the government takes tax money, spends them on the military, we don't think that amounts to socialism because socialism means redistribution of wealth, not like taking the wealth for yourself. That's specifically not redistribution. Secondly, we don't think that these malevolent dictators that they talk about will actually pursue like great policies on their side of the house. We don't think that they'll pursue like uh, like pouring, like giving money to innovative industries that actually go ahead and benefit the poor. We think they'll support industries that benefit themselves, such as like the diamond industry, where they can get a huge amount of diamonds uh, and benefit their own world. We don't think that they'll be likely to like allow companies that redistribute wealth because it's fundamentally in the interest of the dictators to keep the population poor so they can stay rich. Therefore, we don't think they'll pursue great liberal policies. But even if the government incentives are so skewed, we think that there's a measure of accountability. And we think the measure of accountability from the population is improved on outside the house. Why is that? That's because when people are like uh, are richer and have they have more education, they have more knowledge about the society in which they live. That means they're better able to call out like a, a malevolent dictator and say, "Hey, we don't support this. We think this is horrible. Look at all these other states where we have like great governments that redistribute money." We think people are more likely to say that, hold the government accountable when they actually have the resources. That means that they have education and knowledge about these things. Do you think that's why their point about corruption fundamentally stands? Because we can only fundamentally improve the life conditions of the poor by giving them the resources that they need. We're so proud to approve pro pro those things. Thank you so much. on this table today focuses on the short term. They tell you that all the problems that they brought up in this debate today will be apparently solved by this concept of socialism. However, their definition of socialism is challenged by opposition, which has not been responded accurately by proposition. I will bring it to, up to you in this debate. And I will solve that burden for proposition's benefit. Secondly, they confused between the and misunderstood the motion in and of itself. It's not this house supports partial socialism, it's this house supports Socialism, complete socialism. And it does not mean this house supports communism at all. And I will give you a, def a, a, a differentiation between that as well. About the practical solution, the practicality of the motion, the proposition had no response to that. Although we challenged it again and again about various aspects of the minorities, the autocratic regimes, and how it's applicable in each case. These burdens have not been solved by team proposition, which based on the five major burdens that team proposition 
question has resolved in the debate. Number one is that they have to justify and prove to us how there will be no sort of abuse by the government of this power. Number two, they have to tell us how more powerful people will get their share, but not poorer. Then it's number two. Three, they have to tell us why they cannot use modern economic theory, why it's lesser and any lesser than uh, uh, socialism. And number four, they have to tell us what guarantee do they have that but just providing money to poor people to, to help them develop. And number five, they have to tell us how when they only fall apart to socialism, they and, uh, they not support socialism. How essentially are they driving all their arguments from? And going on to the first one, there are two major clashes in this de debate today. Number one, it does the principle of utilitarianism uh, fulfill in deep propositions. Model number two is uh, is complete differentiation between socialism, communism, modern economic theory. I'll draw a differentiation and prove to you how team opposition has an upper hand. We want the first one, uh, the, uh, the principle of utilitarianism and how it does not go along with team proposition and socialism. Team proposition, if you've noticed, has shifted between uh, uh, shifted between the stances to other speakers. First, they told us if you're earning, if you're working for seventy, um, uh, if you're working for this particular hours a day, you will have to get enough retribution, right? You have to get uh, or get what uh, the talent you put in and the work and hard work you put in. You will have to get a benefit out of it. You will have to get that money. Then their second speaker tells um, so tell you, hey, it does not matter because passion is what drives you and what drives you forward, and passion is what gives you utilitarianism and what achieves utilitarianism in society. Well, that's a basic contradiction because what they are essentially telling us that we want all the uh, we want all the uh, people of this world today to drive and work purely on the base of passion and not for the benefit of gaining money. They're telling us money does not matter in the society today, but that's not unfortunately how the world works today because we are all selfish human beings and we have to agree that we are all competitive human beings and we cannot drive or work or or, uh, or develop ourselves without a particular incentive and without an incentive the world cannot run and the proposition has the burden to tell us why they are shifting and agreeing with our stances in several of these speeches. Secondly, second major contradiction the proposition made is about progressive taxation. The first speaker comes up to tell us, hey progressive taxation, according to the, the more you earn the more you tax. That's how modern economic theory works ladies and gentlemen. The more you earn the more you tax. But it is moderated, under controlled capitalism, as which many of the countries follow this uh, today. And progressive taxation ultimately proves, ultimately solves the problems that deproposition brings up from the first two species, which was uh, accident of birth and the private property which you unjustly acquire. Because when you tax the person who uh, tax the person who has uh, uh, property or better pro uh, more property, and you get a retribution f uh, for its unjustly acquired property, ultimately you're solving that inequality that the proposition claims is there. Thirdly, they, uh, this, this, uh, this shows you that minority rights can also be preserved under team opposition's models. The team proposition's major burden to us is to tell, yeah. tell us how minority rights of the poor, of, of the poor and also the underprivileged sections of the society will be, uh, will be uh, helped or uh, will be helped or uh, supported by socialism and they have to tell the principle and how are they flawed that way. This I will prove to you by dividing the, uh, by telling you the differentiation between socialism and communism, which we have done through the speakers, but the proposition has refused to engage. Socialism is when all resources are controlled by the state, be they transport, resources, or they be, they be transport, resources, and all sorts of resources, non-competitive and competitive. While communism is an extreme form of social, uh, it's, it's communism is when all these resources are not controlled, but they're taken by the government and they're redistributed. So this redistribution happens in communism and not in socialism, because the because socialism it's controlled and not redistributed, controlled, and they're not taking your resources. Essentially, they're controlling your resources, but all resources. But what does modern economic theory say to you? Modern economic theory says to you the resources which are un the resources, resources which are non-competitive will be controlled by the government. Non-competitive. What does that mean? Education, transport, defense, all those things that the proposition told is at stake by or at stake today in this world today is what is controlled by the government already by modern economic theory. Now what does the team proposition has a problem with that? What does the proposition has any problem? Not the proposition's problem with education and the person not being able to send their kids home are all nullified because under modern economic theory, these resources are essentially being controlled. Secondly, things such as private property and industry are in the hands of the people and not in the hands of the government, ultimately promoting a democratic principle of how people get to choose their lives and people get to decide what their identity is. And the proposition failed to prove to us how when identities are arbitrary, they are able to uh, they were able to tell what kind of uh, what kind of uh, interest a person has. Before that, any people? Yeah. Why is it that private, like, profit-oriented industries of 
better at providing services and governments who actually care about the long term like um, quality of life of their population. So see, the proposition is saying that governments care about the long term uh, aspect of life. Governments want the, the workforce to be empowered. That governments want competition, and they want to instill that competition, right? That's what the proposition says. And the proposition says, 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 uh, says that the private companies don't do the same. Well, why? we'll tell you why. We told you in our argument of corruption that the abuse of power is very prevalent. Like any government, be they very good governments such as Denmark, when you give them absolute power, what's going to happen is that they're going to abuse it. For example, we told you of China because they brought up communism anyways. So China, we have that abuse of powers anyways. So if we are debating on lines of team proposition, the government, even if they are a government who wants to contribute or uh, instill a workforce in competition, ultimately because of the selfish mindset of human beings, they're more likely to consolidate all the resources and use it for themselves. And that's what's going to happen and the government is going to fall because they're not going to think about the long-term benefits. What they want is to hoard all these resources for themselves and benefit themselves and they only want to benefit themselves. And that's what's happening in economics, that's what, that's what happened in economics of Soviet Union where, uh, where minority rights, where my, uh, human rights uh, violations was very prevalent. Secondly, we challenged the definition of team prop proposition. We told you the definition of socialism of team proposition is unclear, which was their burden to tell us. They, their burden was to tell us what the principles of socialism was. And the only principles they stated was right to equality and minority rights. None of which was proved along the lines of team proposition. Why? Because they shifted from the stance of socialism and ultimately the communism and said partial socialism is what they support. Partial socialism. Well, in modern economic theory, we do have an essence of socialism in it, right? But we're not, we do not want socialism or, uh, as a whole because it's a defect for the society. It uh, hampers democratic values of how people should control their resources and define their identity. And that's the proposition. Okay. Okay. Thank you, speaker, for those remarks. And now we have five speakers. exactly what kind of world the proposition creates. No matter how much you try to ignore the reality of their world, no matter how much you tell us that, you know what, we only stand for principle, but not about how it actually works in real life. We believe, we don't tell you exactly why it is a horrible world to live on side proposition. We tell you why you do not have an identity in the first place. You do not have an identity because they just undermine it completely by saying it's arbitrary. We believe in such a world, you have no self-actualization. You have no choice to like define yourself and have and have like an individuality, a different identity from a person to person. We believe that is what defines us humans. We are not all similar. All of us are different. All of us have different interests. The 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 all of us have different interests. They are not the same. And the proposition has failed to recognize this very fact. So we believe even if like you know we accept all the benefits about how they uh, how they create development, we believe even if they create development, no one wants to live in such a world, right? Because even if you have like some form, some like some form of money, but then even then they don't let you use that money for your own benefit. They don't let you use it for your own benefit, and then that is the that is the reason why they don't win today's debate. So first of all, what was the main mistake made by the proposition? They support everything from like communism to partial socialism, but they fail to fully accept what socialism stands for. They tell us no, we do not stand for complete socialism, and if you don't even, we don't even, we don't even want to talk about how it is, how, what is. Uh, practical implications are. We need to fail to completely engage on the analysis that we give to you as opposition regarding the actual practical implications that their principles have. We believe they have 
have made a big mistake in such a way. So again, we tell you how on our side, we do stuff with the principles they stand for, but we still believe in moderation. <coughs> when they tell us that we need to help the poor, we need to develop the poor, how we need to believe in utilitarianism by providing resources to the poor, we tell you we do do that, right? We do allow these poor people to develop. We do provide them with, we do provide them with mechanisms. We tell you how even in the state is poor, it is not that there is no way in which the poor can develop themselves. We tell you that they can develop themselves. There are mechanisms by which they, that, by which there can be some form of development to them. And we believe in such a way we do care about the poor, we do make their lives better off. We tell you and the, we tell you this is the way in which we do like have some form of common ground with them. But then what do they do on their side? They completely strip away our identity. They tell you that they promote development, but they provide no incentive. We need to understand a very important thing. Incentives always work better than intrinsic moral values, right? Because if an intrinsic moral values were so strong, then why do we need checks and balances? Why do we need voting? Why not just let democracy do its thing with the moral things? Like, you know, because they have strong moral obligation. Because that's simply not how the world works. Strong incentives are necessary to create a successful mechanism. They fail to tackle us on that and we believe they have made a serious mistake again. Because those incentives do not matter. They tell you all that matters is these moral obligations. But we do not believe that. And again, we also tell you about incentives on our side. We tell you how people themselves are selfish, right? They are competitive. They need incentives to work. They need incentives. And what is the incentive on our side? We tell you they require this money, right? Because we didn't need this money for self-actualization. Because they tell us that, you know what, we're going to give them education, we're going to give them health care. But then why would a person get educated, like to become a doctor or a lawyer, if it does not matter? Because on their side, they stand for equal wages. They tell us it does not matter how much you work. It does not matter if your IQ is very high. In the end, you will be paid the same. So again, there's no incentive to even access these resources, like health care, like education, which they put up in the first place. We think this is where, again, the beauty engages, and how they fail to prove why they cause any form of development. Because we tell you, on our side, we cause development. And when there is development, we believe all the com all parts of the community have to uh, like there is some form of development for all parts of the community. Even if the poor, like they are also they also get development in some extent. So we do have the poor in our side. But what they do is that they make lives a voice of for each and every part of society. And we believe this is why they have lost today's debate. And thus, I'm very proud of the Thank you very much. And now to conclude the debate for those out of the house and for all of us, a reply speak for the government. Here you go. and find as socialist countries when we see that they don't have they have the least amount of corruption overall internationally and when they still have innovation that is because this is the wrong word that they pushed upon us but they failed to adapt to the very clear model that they provided it with heavy progressive taxation which is not the same as people receiving exactly the amount the same amount of money which is communism what they made as the biggest strategic mistake here was if they failed to see what they needed to prove to you in order to win this debate. They needed to prove to you why companies are a good actor on the side of the house to provide both the idealitarianism that they conceded to and the idea of proportionality and innovation. Thus, we have fundamentally won today's debate. <coughs> now, what did we see the team opposition did today? They went for this very wishy-washy, not clear stance, right? They told you that they could both have progressive tax and they could have the proportionality and good stuff of companies being sort of independent and benefiting their societies. On the other hand, everything we had, had to defend on that side, according to them, was communism, right? We could not tell you that this was merely a degree of progressive taxation, right? This is the situation between the United States, where we have very low progressive tax, and you have people who are 
feel lost in the rest of society, and Scandinavian countries where you have really heavy progressive taxation and the trade-off is still made, the trade-off of people being prioritized above innovation, above companies' able, uh, ability to flourish, right? And this is why we think that the idea of upholding the happiness of people is something that was important and that we want on. Right, so let's just, let's just take a look at what did they hinge their case upon uh, today. First off, they talk to you about the idea of innovation. Why? This is lost on our sub house because when you don't receive extra money for working, you don't go out and innovate. We identified for you a new group of people that are going to be lost in their sub house. And these are the people who have innovative minds, but are born into families that cannot afford the education for them. So they end up in the lower sectors of society. This is a very important factor, actor, that we think that they needed to tell us why it was subsequent to the idea of innovation, why that would still stand. Thus, we think that this whole claim that we had to defend the uh, like non-existing innovation really fell. Now, what this, what did we, what did they also tell you about? They has the case upon like how corruption is something that is very likely to happen on our side of the house. We gave you a couple of responses to why this is not true. Firstly. We said that, most importantly, we talked about how when people are informed, they're more likely to identify political oppression within their system. This simply doesn't happen on the side because we have people that do not have the information on why the government is what the government is pressing them, right? They have um, they have a voice to voice the experiences that they have because they have the information provided for them through the egalitarianism, egalitarianistic society, right? But what did we identify you as the other metric that would happen on their side of the house? This was the anger towards the system that disenfranchised you because of where you were born, right? This really didn't have any response, like how people are not going to be happy with their system on their side either, right? We think that this is, in the end, the perception of governments is something that we won on in that scenario. Now, let's just do the weighing of these two scenarios. Even if you accept that we lose innovation, even if you think that we were supposed that we were to uh, uh, defend communism, that you cannot spend money on what you want, right? You cannot be individualistic. We do not see why all of these things are more important than the fact that they leave people behind in the system. That you can be born into family and disenfranchised because of that. If you cannot uphold what you want, your ideas and your pursuit of happiness, and that that is fundamentally something that they needed to weigh for us, right? We think that in the end they actually conceded to this idea, and that's we think that the principle is really important in the debate. In the end, the panel, we've proved to you with the consent of opposition that the lottery of birth is important in the society, in the society, and that is why we win today's debate. Very proud to be here. Thank you so much. We um, enjoyed the debate. We invite both teams to cross the house, shake hands, uh, gather your materials, step out. I understand that it is a closed round and we'll announce.